So, good morning. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about a unique deposition technique that I've been developing in my lab with my uh, group. It's called Resonant Infrared Matrix Assisted Pulse Laser Evaporation, or RAR Maple for short. Um, and so if you were in the earlier session today on materials and energy, you heard some about uh, using solution processable materials for making solar cells for renewable energy, for solar energy conversion. And we've heard about a lot of reasons why you want to do that. One, it's inexpensive. You can do this very nice roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing and processing. And in general, by solution-based or solution processing, there are three very general steps that show up whatever type of solution-based processing you're doing. Uh, one is that you have to make your target solutions, whatever materials it is that you want to deposit. Uh, you have to spread the solution somehow on whatever your substrate is. And then you have to allow your solvent that you use to evaporate. And that has a big impact on what your thin film properties are. Um, so while the solution-based deposition has all of these advantages and reasons why we're interested, there are some significant disadvantages, especially in the context of having organic and inorganic materials mixed together in whatever your thin film is going to be. And some of these disadvantages, then, are related to this solvent evaporation process. So the first is that you tend to have phase separation, especially between your organic and inorganic components, as the solvent evaporates. Uh, another is that you're not able to blend together or create a film where your materials have different solubility characteristics. So for example, hydrophobic and hydrophilic, there's going to be some type of separation between those two phases dictated by the chemistry of the materials. And then the third is, again, you're not able to deposit multi-layer films uh, because an earlier film that you deposited would be destroyed by depositing another layer if it had the same solubility. So there are all these restrictions in terms of what you can make with the solution-based processing. Now, one way to address these challenges is to deposit the films in a dry state. And uh, that's what I'm going to uh, talk about in terms of this uh, maple process. So, what's the wish list? What would you like to be able to do with these polymer films? Especially when you're integrating, again, the organic and inorganic materials. Well, one, you want to be able to control the film morphology at the surface and within the bulk of the material. Uh, you want to be able to deposit blended films uh, and where you can control the composition of the film and you have these nanoscale phase domains so that your bulk material is behaving in some combination of the constituent materials. Again, you like to be able to have multi-layer films regardless of solubility. And you like to be able to have the same process all the time, whatever, you know, regardless of what your substrate is or what material is that you're depositing. That's sort of a wish list. So the overall motivation for what we've been doing in my group is to provide this nanoscale control, especially over hybrid organic and inorganic materials that comprise what I'm calling functional macromolecules. So some of this can be done with small molecules and thermal evaporation. A much larger challenge is if you have functional materials, macromolecules, or polymers, trying to get the same type of functionality. And so then an analogy to epitaxial growth of inorganic materials. So I did my PhD on 3,5 compound semiconductors by molecular beam epitaxy. That is informing a lot of the way I think about these materials. And when you're doing that type of epitaxial growth, an analogy to that, we would do that in an organic system where you have tailored material composition, novel film structure, and the ability to do heterostructure design for devices, being able to do that in an organic um, material system. So what I want to do now is introduce uh, this RIR maple technique, a little bit of information about how it works, and then I'll go over some of the applications that I think would be most interesting to industry. So this technique, emulsion-based RIR maple, is a variation of pulsed laser deposition. Uh, so it's a, it's a vacuum deposition technique. There are two big differences from your traditional PLD, or pulse laser deposition. One is that it uses an infrared laser as opposed to a, a UV laser. And that's important because now the energy from that infrared laser won't damage the organic materials that you're depositing. Another big difference is the target. So instead of having typically some type of solid ceramic target, we do have a solid target, but it's a frozen emulsion. So we have active cooling by liquid nitrogen during the deposition process. And uh, this gives us the solid target. So the basic idea then is that uh, the laser energy is absorbed by your matrix material. So that's the matrix assisted part. That matrix material evaporates and you have the gentle transfer of whatever your target material is, which is typically organic, let's just say a polymer chain, is gently transferred from the target to the substrate. 
And we have various parameters that we can control during this uh, uh, vacuum deposition uh, process. So the general idea then with this emulsion, our matrix, what's the matrix that we care about? What's been unique with our approach is that we're using these emulsions. And so the peak uh, laser wavelength at 2.94 microns is resonant with the vibrational modes of OH bonds. And so what we decided to use as our matrix then is water, which is why we make emulsions. This actually gives us a lot of versatility because we can use any target material, whatever solvent it likes best, and make an emulsion with water. And so, uh, in this way, then we decouple the laser energy from the material that we're depositing. That's given us a lot of versatility in terms of the range of materials that we can deposit. Uh, another important part then, so since the laser is resonant with these OH bonds, we can sort of tune the deposition uh, regime that we are in. So if we have very few OH bonds, so for example, using phenol as the matrix instead of the water emulsions, uh, then we get much more actual splashing of the target onto the substrate. You can get really rough films which might be useful for something like a gas sensor. Um, a lot of the work that we've been doing is related to the organic solar cells, in which case you want to have a very smooth film. And it's better to get into this regime where you have more OH bonds that are present. And so what's de defining the difference between these is the laser energy density in the film. So basically, if you have more OH bonds, you have a higher laser energy density, uh, and you get more evaporation of your, uh, of your target. So the emulsion part, I've talked about that a little bit, but just to give you a better idea of what I mean. So we have many components in this emulsion that makes up the target. So first we have whatever our best material is, a polymer, and this dissolved in some uh, solvent that it likes the best, in this case let's say chlorobenzene. Uh, and so this is just a dissolve, called the primary solvent, it just dissolves our organic material. And then we have a secondary solvent, in most cases we've been using phenol. So this secondary solvent we think is doing two primary things. One, we're enriching the amount of OH bonds that are present for this laser absorption. And then second, it's going to be a less volatile uh, solvent so that we don't have direct evaporation of the target in this vacuum system. Uh, and then third, it is an emulsion. So we add the DI water and we do have to include a surfactant in that process uh, to make the emulsions and to get our emulsion target. So I mentioned, right, one thing that's nice about this is we don't damage the materials that we're depositing. So we've shown this uh, by Fourier transform infrared absorption spectroscopy. So just looking at, in this case, this was a polymer, a PPV-based polymer. And looking at the uh, absorption, infrared absorption, to show that there's been no photochemical damage. So in this case, this dotted line is showing a drop cast film where we can see the OH present from the phenol that's missing from the, uh, from, uh, uh, from the maple film, uh, from the maple film that's deposited. But the other bonds are all very similar to what you get from just a drop cast film where there been, hasn't been this laser process. Um, one thing that's very interesting and unique to the RR maple that we do with the emulsion-based processes is that we don't have the photochemical damage, but we also aren't structurally damaging these polymer chains, meaning we don't reduce the molecular weight of the polymer as a result of this process. So if you look at the native molecular weight of a polymer, versus the molecular weight after the deposition, if there's been no change, you expect then for the data point to lie on this line. So what's interesting is from some of the different variations of maple that people are researching, uh, all of them are in this degradation range, whereas the RER maple is pretty much uh, on this line, even for very high molecular weights. Uh, the one exception is the MEHPPV polymer, which we think is just very sensitive in any case. Um, so another thing that's unique about our approach is this idea of uh, simultaneous deposition versus sequential deposition. So for simultaneous deposition, if I wanted to deposit a hybrid organic and organic nanoposite, the nanocomposite, so in this case I'm talking about having uh, colloidal quantum dots, inorganic semiconductor nanoparticles embedded in a polymer matrix. Uh, there are two ways you could go about doing that. One is you make a single solution of both materials, and you make a single uh, a target, and you do the deposition. And we can see from these transmission electron microscopy images that these are the types of morphologies that we get. So this is a one micron scale, 100 nanometers, 50 nanometers. So we get sort of these circular clusters within the film. Uh, but the other approach is what we call sequential RIR maple, where we partition the target. So you have one emulsion for your nanoparticles, one emulsion for your polymer. Uh, the laser rasters across the target as it rotates, and you get a completely different morphology of your films. Uh, much more uh, uniform dispersion, and these are the same size ranges, so one micron, 100 nanometers, and 50 nanometers. 
So having this control over the morphology in these hybrid organic and organic uh, nanocomposite films. Um, and then just to give you an idea, so, um, so we have developed this emulsion-based approach to IR maple, so there are still a lot of fundamental questions about the mechanisms of the technique that we're working to understand. So for example, um, in that target emulsion, the thermodynamics and kinetics that control the emulsion properties, which we know has a direct impact on what the film properties are. Now one example, so this just gives an example, so these emulsions, we have these emulsified particles of the polymer, so these polymer clusters and the size of those polymer clusters has this impact on the film properties. So as an example, if we change the primary solvent uh, for this polymer, PCPDTBT, which is a low band gap polymer used in solar cells. As we change the primary solvent and the properties of the primary solvent changes, we get these very different surface roughnesses on the film. So going from 33.8 nanometers uh, root mean squared surface roughness to about 8.7 nanometers, just from what the primary solvent is. So this type of uh, effect is something we're trying to understand better. So that's a brief introduction to uh, emulsion-based RAR maple. Now I'm going to talk about some of the reasons why you might be interested in it, especially for industrial applications. So one, again, is this ability to make hybrid organic inorganic materials. And again, specifically talking about you know, functional materials that you might want to use for devices especially. So one advantage uh, and capability that's unique to the RAR maple is the ability to change the composition and structure of these materials. So for example, this would just be a basic hybrid uh, nanocomposite, or you might think of it as a bulk heterojunction, where you have all these interfaces from, say, a nanoparticle in a polymer matrix. And one thing that's unique about maple, as I'll show more clearly up here, I'll go ahead and talk about it now. So with the hybrid nanocomposites, we get a fundamentally different morphology by maple, right? If you compare to spin casting. So this is a cadmium selenide, selenide a nanoparticle embedded in that same low band gap polymer for solar cells. And uh, looking at, using as the primary solvent trichlorobenzene, a spin coated film and a film deposited by RR Maple. The scale bar here is 200 nanometers. These are transmission electron uh, microscopy images. And the main point is that you can see that the morphology is totally different. And this morphology is solvent dependent. So depending on the primary solvent, you can get different structures within that spin cast film, whereas the maple film has a consistent uh, morphology that's independent of the solvent uh, and is much more dispersed in terms of the nanoparticles within the polymer. Uh, and so having that type of capability, also the ability to make a gradient profile. So basically a gradient bulk header junction where Along the uh, Z direction, the, the thickness of the film changing that composition of the bulk heterojunction dynamically during growth. And that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of controlling film properties. And then also the possibility for having basically a super lattice structure where you have layered structures of alternating materials. So our ability to make these types of structures we think will enable unique, unique thin film properties. And so in this case, talking about uh, special light absorption specifically for applications to solar cells. So in this case, this is an example of a project I'm doing with Mike and Mickelson that's sponsored by the Duke uh, Energy Initiative, where we're incorporating silver nanoparticles into the active region of an organic solar cell. And here, uh, looking at the UV visible absorbance of this structure, so minus the aluminum, so we have our, our glass substrate, a P dot PSS layer, the active region, which is just a polymer in this place, case with the silver nanoparticles. And this absorbs, absorbance uh, of reference has been subtracted where you have the active region without the silver nanoparticles. And seeing that based on the growth deposition time, for the longest deposition, we have an absorbance that's very similar to the silver nanoparticles alone. But again, just being able to change the absorbance properties of a film by controlling this maple growth. And I'll talk about this application again in a little bit. Another example uh, David Mitzi spoke about earlier today Again, looking at the perovskites, so it talks about how perovskites are very exciting for the organ uh, for solar cells because they've gotten such high efficiencies in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, but one thing that's unique about them is that they are a hybrid material, organic and inorganic components. And a challenge can be, especially if you want to start playing around with what this recipe is, how to find a solvent that's com uh, compatible to both components. But we eliminate that need by maple. Um, and so we've just started very preliminary studies looking at perovskite deposition uh, by RR maple. So looking at things such as the impact of the thickness of the film and also the temperature of the substrate during the deposition to see how we can control uh, the process. 
Another uh, example is uh, some uh, work starting to do with April Brown that takes me back to my original love of MBE, molecular beam epitaxy. But again, looking at this idea of hybrid organic and organic materials, and in this case, interfaces, uh, where you can have unique surface terminations uh, by introducing invisible elements into a 3 5 uh, semiconductor surface, and then looking at how they interact and their oxides, how they interact with different types of uh, molecules, the small molecules. And so using molecular beam epitaxy to do that, as well as interaction with the RIR maple. And this could be something that uh, enables unique sensors, for example, by having these functional interfaces that you can control. So I want to spend some time talking about the work that we've done in organic solar cells. So a lot of our work in this area has been to first understand where we are in terms of maple deposition and where, what it gives us with the organic solar cells. Just as a quick review, um, for the organic solar cells, the working mechanism is basically you absorb light, uh, you create an exciton. That exciton has to travel to the interface of two different materials, the donor and acceptor material. At that interface, you can separate the exciton, and so then you can collect uh, electrons and holes separately in the two different materials, the donor material and the acceptor material, for the charge collection. So this is an example of a bulk heterojunction, and you have these interfaces of the donors and acceptors all throughout the active region. Um, so uh, for a typical type of material system, so this is that low band gap polymer, this is a small molecule, so these are two organic materials. Uh, we've started, uh, we've deposited these devices here, so in this case we were just changing the composition of the two components in the bulk heterojunction to find out which was the best for our process. Uh, because you don't define composition in the same way that you do for solution-based deposition. And so we got something about 1 to 1.5 at 0.86 power conversion efficiency. Um, if you'll notice, in this case, our primary solvent was chlorobenzene. So another study that we did was just to change the primary solvent. So we looked at trichlorobenzene, dichlorobenzene, and chlorobenzene toluene. So the same way we saw those very different morphologies in the TEM images I showed before, when we looked at the solar cells that go along with that, we saw a very big variation in the uh, solar cell power conversion efficiency just by changing the primary solvent. And this parameter space is wide open. We've just begun trying to understand this better and what it means for the organic solar cells. So we went up to about 1.2% power conversion efficiency just by changing the primary solvent. Uh, also, again, this idea of the hybrid organic inorganic solar cells. So in this case, this is looking at this uh, cadmium selenide nanoparticle embedded in that low band gap polymer. And again, just trying to get a handle on which composition gives us the best performance. So we found that with an 80% loading of the quantum dots, we got the highest power conversion efficiency for this particular study. Um, one thing that's exciting about the maple, while our device efficiencies are still much lower than what you get from the solution-based deposition, we have the capability of doing unique heterostructures and designs. So one example are tandem structures. We're not limited by the solubility of existing layers. And another is being able to change the active region structure itself. So as opposed to the bulk heterojunction, which people do, we can do something like a braided layer, where you change gradually the composition uh, from the polymer to the small molecule as you go through the device. We've actually grown these and characterized them, and we've confirmed that we do actually have a gradient in the composition from the surface. Uh, by doing um, argon sputtering in XPS measurements. Uh, and so uh, we've also done some um, uh, Monte Carlo simulations to try to predict what our devices should be based on, on, the, on the material structure. And so from the simulation, we expect that the graded structure here should have a much higher uh, power conversion efficiency compared to the other two. Our model itself, in this case, is uh, lower than the measured devices, but that's because of the unit cell size we use in the simulation. But the main point is that this gradient gives us better performance. And so getting better control over the gradient, I think, is a unique avenue to improving organic solar cell performance that's provided by a maple deposition technique. Uh, and so my last example is multifunctional surfaces and coatings. Um, again, this ability to combine different materials in a bulk film with nanoscale phase uh, separation means that you can make a bulk film with a unique property or unique function that's based on the components that you've put together. So in this case, and this is work that I did with uh, Gabriel Lopez, we first looked at antimicrobial surfaces. So we looked at this uh, OPE uh, macromolecule, which has antimicrobial function if you shine UV light on it. 
And uh, this is just demonstrating that when we deposited this uh, OP or PPE by maple and shine the light, we do actually kill bacteria. The thing that was really interesting about it, though, is that the RR maple films have this uh, nanostructure to the surface roughness. So if you look at the surface roughness for maple spin coating and drop casting, you have this very uh, uh, high nanoscale surface roughness, which led to a much larger attachment of bacteria on the surface uh, compared to the other two approaches. And then also along with it, then had a higher killing efficiency. So this nanoscale surface roughness, which is unique to the maple deposition process and how it works, is actually part of the challenge we're facing with the organic solar cells. While it's a challenge for the solar cells, it's an advantage for this application. Um, another type of uh, polymer that's interesting are stimuli, uh, stimuli responsive polymers. So you have some type of external stimulus and you can change the conformation of the polymer. In this case, we looked at this uh, penny pam, which uh, basically uh, it becomes uh, soluble or non-soluble depending on its temperature. So above uh, 32 degrees, you can attach bacteria and then below 32 degrees Celsius, you can release bacteria. And we have a silane group here so that we could uh, have it attached to our surface during deposition. So we deposited these by maple. The thing that's really interesting though is that we combine both together. So we had that antimicrobial OPE, we had the stimuli responsive polymer that could release the bacteria, and now you have a multifunctional surface that can attach bacteria, kill them, and release the bacteria to regenerate the surface so it can be reused. And we've demonstrated that type of cycling. In this case, what we showed was that just by changing the percentage of the antimicrobial component in the target, we could control the functionality of the film. So in this case, the amount of the antimicrobial component is increasing and the killing e efficiency increases. At the same time, the release function to regenerate the surface decreases and we can find an optimum uh, uh, composition. Uh, so I uh, want to acknowledge uh, the graduate students in my group that have uh, contributed to this work, collaborators and funding agencies. And also want to point out that Ryan McCormick is currently a postdoc in my group. Um, he's working on a startup company through funding provided by electrical uh, and computer engineering department. And he has a poster today talking about some of the work we've done with Maple applied to uh, sensors for volatile organic compounds. Questions for uh, Adrian? This is the flowers. Um, I was curious with regards to the use of maple for organic photovoltaics. What would you say is the biggest challenge? I noticed from the CV shapes, most of them seem to show a sign of uh, shunt resistance as being an issue. So do you see a decent amount of pinholes you'd like to get rid of? Or what, what would you say? So there are two big challenges. One is fundamental, and that is that surface roughness uh, for the film. So we think that our contacts are not the best at the surface with our metal, our metal electrodes, because we have that nanoscale surface roughness that's good for the bacterial attachment, it's bad for the solar cells. But like I said, we're doing studies now to understand how we can control that. We saw a huge difference just by changing the primary solvent. So the secondary solvent is refracted. That entire parameter space for both the um, emulsion and the chamber deposition so, so we have hope that we can fix it. Um, but I think that's the biggest challenge. The second challenge is practical in that our maple chamber is not connected to a glove box. So as soon as we grow the sample and take it out, there is some degradation that happens right away before we can get an epoxy to insulate, to, uh, to, to cover the, the device. Have you looked into the adhesion of the film of the substrate? Um, not specifically. So we did come with, up with some adhesion issues when we looked at those multifunctional surfaces when we had the penny pan because it was water soluble. So a lot of other approaches to this, they do grafting directly to the surface so it's attached. And the maple process doesn't do that. And so we were completely removing the penny pan. When we added things like the silane or a third component to sort of entangle the polymer on the surface, we reduced those adhesion issues. Um, so we've not investigated that specifically, but I think there are things we could do like treating the substrate before deposition or making sure our materials have some type of end group um, that works with whatever the substrate is. Hi, Adrian. Um, quick question about the um, commercialization. I know I talked to Ryan a couple times, so is, I don't think Ryan's here. He was here so. earlier. Yeah. We'll a closer session. <laughs> yeah, yeah. May I ask, ask him? But my qu question is just do you envision any challenges in terms of the uh, cost of the deposition technique, and is that is that going to be something that uh, is competitive with other you know sort of commercial scale techniques? That's right. 
So a couple things that we think about that. One is vacuum technology exists in commercial applications right now. This is nothing like MBE. So this is a vacuum system, but it's not ultra high vacuum. We're talking about during growth, our vacuums are on the order of a milliton. So it's not ultra high vacuum. And there's food processing that requires vacuum on that order. So if you think about that type of industry, that type of cost, probably something comparable on food products obviously can't be super expensive most of the time. And so then also the other thing is um, the target. And we think there's some things that we can do with how we arrange the target assembly and how it works with the laser. What we have is a very small research scale system. We do have some ideas of how we would scale it up. So I don't think it's um, a deal breaker up front. I think there's some engineering that has to be done. And our main goal is to find the application that drives the investment in the required engineering. way to deposit the top contact in C2 before taking it out? Or, so if you have an issue making a contact due to the roughness, is there a way to change out the precursors so that you can maybe deposit uh, maybe even an organic layer, an organic conducting layer, something like a spiral, for example? I do think there's some things that we could do. So it's not exactly what you mean, but yes, have some type of uh, 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 cover layer, right? So like some type of electron transporting layer that for whatever reason is smoother with the maple process, smooth out the film before we put down the metal electrode. The metal electrodes that are typically used, we cannot deposit by maple, so we couldn't deposit like aluminum. Right. We could do nanoparticles. We've done copper nanowires, uh, deposited them as an electrode and looked at uh, how that works. So there's some things you could do like that, maybe if you, if you flip the device architecture, um, but not like a thermally evaporated metal electrode in situ with the system that we have. Well, thank you, Adrian. Thank you.